Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Cash That. This is your host, Joe Delera. This episode is once again brought to you by our good friends at Props.Cash. Props.Cash, the number one player prop betting tool in the market. You've got those red charts, the green charts. You have the hit rate for the WNBA, for the NBA Finals. So you can get all those Caitlin Clark stuff. You can you can filter it. Maybe check out how she's doing before and after the quote-unquote Olympic snub uh, and see if the stats, how the stats line up for her. Um, and you can get that for 25% off your first month with code Delara 25. Once again, that is the NBA, the WNBA, the MLB, the NHL, the NFL, all those stats, all those players, all those games. You can get all of that at your fingertips on your phone or on your desktop with code Delara 25 for 25% off your first month of props.cash guys. It's actually, we have a packed house today. Uh, so it's a great podcast. It's going to be a really good episode today as we break down game three of the NBA finals. Uh, I actually am joined by producer Corey for the first time in what seemed like forever. I think you guys might've thought that I killed him and we have our special <laughs> guest prop bomb who I think has actually been on the pod more recently than producer Corey. So this is actually mm-hmm. quite the, quite the turn of events here. Um, but since you're, our, since you are our guest prop bomb, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Uh, I, I'm liking, I'm hoping that we, the, the Mavericks can make some answers going in, going, you know, into Dallas. Um, and uh, look, I'm in Florida right now. The Panthers are playing right now, but I love this podcast so much. I'm sacrificing watching game two to throw out some bets and, and talk shop with, with Joe. So um, it's, it's going to be a good show. No, it's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm glad that you mentioned hockey a little bit because that's producer Corey's. I was just about uh, to thank him. It, it's his, it's his spot. So I'm just going to pass. Our long national you. nightmare is over. The Rangers <laughs> were eliminated since I've been on here. It was the only thing that I was concerned about for a while. Um, my health took a back seat. It was just about doing whatever I humanly could to um, make sure the Rangers did not proceed to the Stanley Cup Finals. Uh, When's the, the last time they Joel won something? Alive and well, 1994. Like, oh my god, <laughs> that's right, 1994, and it will remain that for another full fucking year. Hallelujah! Uh, shout out to the Panthers. Bob got the job done. Thank Bobby. you. Hey, they were so big. I know, I know you were sweating it a little bit, so I'm glad that this, you know, that your nightmare is over here. Maybe it's a little bit of an early wedding present for producer Corey. Um, producer Corey's getting married very soon. I had to get my tuxedo fitted. So it's been, I, I know it's been busy for, I know it's been busy for him lately between that kind of switching some jobs around. So uh, it is good to have producer Corey back in the fold before the NBA season does end here and before the NHL season ends. So he could just dig that. Last I have to say thank you to in. all, all the people who um, were tweeting at me saying that Joe had somehow killed me and uh, kept it all under wraps. <laughs> he didn't. I'm here, obviously. Corey, they were funny. Corey's in the yeah. house. That's it right. is what it is. Corey's we, I, I told you guys I didn't kill producer Corey. We have we have yeah. video proof of it now too. So it is a it is a pretty big deal to have you back <laughs> on the pod here. Uh, here, proof of life. Here's today's date. We're good. Right. We're good. <laughs> um, so I, I do want to dive into the NBA playoffs here, obviously the NBA finals, um, producer Corey, since you've been gone, the, we are on game three of the NBA finals. Now the Boston Celtics are up two nothing on the Dallas Mavericks. Um, it's been a really interesting series. I think that there's been opportunities for Dallas to, to, to win a game, but at the same time, Boston has really looked in command and in control of the series. Uh, Prop on what has been through two games, what has been your biggest takeaway from the series at this point in time? Um, for me, it's just Boston in general. Boston, they're playing like a team. Every single player is stepping up. Every single player is having their moments. Um, Jason Kidd tried so hard to get in Jason, Tate, uh, in Jason Tatum's head, saying the whole who's the better player, who's not, and it didn't get to him. Like I just think this team's a lot more mature than than Dallas um the way that they're able to stretch the floor every single player is a shooter is giving Dallas problems that they're not used to seeing um they're relentless attacking the rim which uh opens up a lot of clean three-pointer looks and um you know with Dallas it's just you know Luca's doing all the work and the supporting cast just isn't hitting their shots so um you know I'm hoping that the supporting cast starts hitting the shots so this is a more competitive series 
Yeah, it's definitely been really interesting, you know, watching how these teams have been able to play because Dallas really thrived throughout the course of the entire playoffs and like a pretty healthy dose of three point shots, especially from. Yeah, the that's kind of been their identity. Yeah. Exactly. And then now, you know, through the last couple of games against uh, Boston, they've really ha- seen like a big significant turn in their three point volume. And they're actually only taking 4% of their shots from the corner. That is just an mm-hmm. insane. It's an insane number. Yeah, yeah. When you consider the fact that during the playoffs, they were actually up in t- they were up at 12.1%, which doesn't sound like a lot for you know like for you know if you're thinking about percentages whatever but that was fifth most out of all playoff teams um so they they've really kind of gotten that taken away from them and when you're playing such a good three-point shooting team like boston you you definitely are losing a little bit of this math battle and boston just is naturally going to have a little bit better of an edge um Mm-hmm. The craziest thing is, too, in game two, they didn't even really shoot that good from three-point range. So Yeah, yeah. look, the, they should have won that. I mean, if they, they had to win that game. They shot 25% the Celtics, and they still won. Yeah. And I guess here's the here's the um, question because yeah. I've gotten this message in my I've gotten this message in my DMs actually a little bit so mm-hmm. and it's something that I talked to because Brandon Anderson came on uh, for game one with Jim Turvey for our finals preview and one of the plays that we talked about um, and, and I, I want to get some of your feedback too on this PB but one of the things that we talked about was basically on a Celtics not to sweep bet um, and we bet Boston in five, six, and seven, uh, one unit each. And it basically was like about minus 120 or so uh, in terms of aggregate. Celtics to not sweep. So it's for, okay, that's minus 120. So basically your exposure was, your exposure is obviously in any Dallas win and in a Boston sweep. Um, Because we felt like, you know, there's enough shooting variance that like Boston probably drops a game um, somewhere along the way. Did you take this bet? When did you take this bet, Joe? This was uh, going into the series? Okay. Yeah, okay. before the series. So one of our one of our followers, he actually messaged me. Um, I think it was he, but he messaged me and uh he he said, um, you know, I, I can basically get for MGM, I can almost get like a full cash out value because we said like you have to line shop it so like bet one here one here one here game seven boston in seven he was like i can almost get a full cash out value at mgm right now should i do it um and my thought to you now and i like i have my answer and i gave it to him but i'm curious to know your thoughts like do you really think that this series can go seven games like does dallas really have a chance because like i feel like their only chance would be in seven because like I think it's going to be very tough for them to win four yeah. in a row, you know, at this juncture. But do you even think that Dallas really has a chance in this series, or you know, are are we just kind of waiting to see how many games you know the NBA can stretch this out for for media purposes? Well, there's two ways of looking at it. The first way is just the the stats that that back it up that you know teams that are two and zero going into game three, eighty five percent of the time. I mean, I'm not 100 percent sure that's the correct percentage, but um, end up winning the series. But also it's just like the, the saying, right? You, it's it's not over until you lose at home. Like the Dallas Mavericks still have to still are haven't yet lost at home yet. So if they win, it's it's still a series. Um, but that being said, um, I'm just counting. I hope that there's five, six games. I see Celtics winning this. Uh, that's simple enough. It's an uphill yeah, battle right. for Jason Kidd and the Mavs. And, and like Luca just keeps getting injured, you know? He's, he's going to keep getting – his health is going to keep going down. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I My gut – when what I, I thought about it at first. I was like, nah. And Matt Moore, he asked me about this on Buckets Live, and I was like, well, he was like, do you want to buy Celtics in four now? Um, and basically like hedge out of your position. And I was like, ah, like I don't no. want to do that because like I feel like I have no. the best part of the number right now. But actually what happened was then I got the DM this morning and I was kicking it around with Brandon and we were like, actually, if you cash it out, you can roll the whole thing into Celtics in four 
at plus 320. So the bet is actually then you you basically we basically reverse engineered uh Celtics minus Oh, that's interesting. Half yeah, after yeah. After already having the position before. So um that okay. like, that's what actually that's what I recommended. Um and you're you're setting yourself to be in a scenario where a game, you know, Celtics in 5 or 6 is best case scenario. Uh Celtics mm-hmm. in 4 then just is a profitable scenario, although the margins are slimmer. Um but like I think so you're I, I felt you're after putting, two games. Yeah, yeah after two yeah. games, I felt like it made more sense seeing that Boston didn't drop one or two, you know, and Boston's up 2-0. We felt that it made more sense to say, like, all right, like let's just like if we can scoop that back and like basically I think we had to pay maybe like seven cents or so to cash it out, um, in terms of like the in terms of the bet. It made more sense okay. because the, the Celtics in seven seems like a dead bet right now. So to be able to cash it out, you could either cash it out and not bet it on four, but it felt like, you know, that like that, based on what we were seeing, that that's like a little bit of a more likely scenario at this point. Yeah, I mean, definitely different, different uh, kind of outlook going into game three than I think everyone had just with the overall kind of talent gap or like. Boston is kind of beating Dallas in almost every single field, like whether it's like transition points, you know, catch and shoot, corner threes, rim attacks. So um, it if you're a Dallas fan, it, it doesn't feel like um, this can honestly go for more than five or six or six or seven games. Yeah, it, it, feels, you know? it definitely feels unlikely that we see a game seven. So given kind of given that, it was nice and like it's kind of one of those things like you don't really think about it but i i guess it is probably one of the advantages of betting in like on legal books depending on which books that you bet on where you are given some of those cash out opportunities and normally like i'm not really a cash out guy i don't think that it's necessarily like plus ev and in this case though because of the way that we constructed the bet where it wasn't like oh like i'm betting boston in seven and only boston in seven like now i don't like it i just want to get out it was like we really were betting boston five six seven and then now it's given us the opportunity to basically say like all right like we're gonna pluck that and then Mm -hmm. buy back in on the boston in four and say like we want boston four five six and so basically a minus one and a half um yeah. So it, it kind of yeah. created, I think it created a good position um, out of one where we were more, there, there was more opportunity for us to lose um, just based on what kind of what we had seen. So if anybody followed that, um, that is what we did. That is like our official like strategy kind of to you guys right now was to cash out the Boston in seven and to bet it back on Boston in four um, because you're getting a bet, bet three, six, five, you're getting plus three twenty on that same bet. So a lot of this really does depend, though, on your ability to line shop, and that's one of your best tools in your arsenal as a better. So, you know, be sure to take advantage of some of these sign-up bonuses, stuff like that, because you really can create bets that aren't necessarily offered. But this was an interesting scenario because we created our own bet, but then it actually gave us some flexibility that we didn't know we were going to have or didn't think we were even going to need until a couple games into the series. Okay. So right, definitely, yeah, yeah. definitely a little bit of an interesting spot. Um, but PB, when we're looking at game three, a lot of mm-hmm. times we see adjustments now because it's like, all yeah. right, we're game, we're through game one, we're through game two. Um, we see a couple things that have happened. It was interesting to watch in game two, for example, how Luca was used primarily as a scorer to start the game, three assists in the first half, then eight assists in the second half, only nine points in the second half. I know a lot of people mm. bet his over 30, 30 and a half or 31 and a half points barely squeaked over after looking incredible in the first half. Um, I know. Yeah. So, I also bet on that one too. Yeah. It was insane. He, we all it was crazy. I felt so confident. I felt so confident. Look, we, it was under eight and a half assists. I think he had one in the first quarter and i thought it yeah, was I smooth sailing yeah I and then he it. has <laughs> literally like eight in the second half yeah um, so i know you you did some digging on why that happened um talk to me about like what you saw boston change to kind of like exploit luca or like change his role in a couple of different ways because they they kind of affected him on both the offensive and defensive side of the ball well, yes. I mean, it's simple as Luka Doncic just started out strong. I think he had 25 points 
like before or 23 points before halftime and the the Celtics start and, and the game was close too. So the Celtics were like, okay, maybe this isn't work. Maybe this isn't working with, with single coverage on Luca. Maybe we should start blitzing him a little bit more. Now I think going into the second half, they started to like double him, put more attention on him. And this way he, he kind of had those like passes, but I was looking at the numbers. Interestingly enough, um, check this stat out. So of the 49 combined post-ups, pick and roll, ISO possessions um, that Luka Doncic recorded in the finals, 42 of them were in single coverage. So although like we thought that they were kind of blitzing him more, you know, zooming it out a little bit, 42 of 49 were in single coverage. So that's more than 80%. of There's still single coverage, coveraging him. Now, I think going into game three, if um, it's tough, it's tough to like, you know, it's tough to buy in like, do we see what the adjustments are going in the second half being what's going into, you know, what's going to be in game three, or is it going to be what happened in the first half? So um, I believe the assist now is at nine and a half. And I think that's a fair number. I'm more so staying away. I think I want to give one more game to see what's going on with it. Yeah. I'm definitely a little nervous about betting it. Cause like we were both on the assist under in game one and you know, like I felt, I felt pretty good about it. Honestly, like I, I like I didn't. There wasn't like a huge swing. Um, and honestly, it was also like, a like, different thing. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Like it was also a no, different no, no, type no. of scenario. Like game one was like a totally different like uh, environment where the Mavs were down twenty going into the second half, right? And then game uh-huh. two it was a little bit different. The game was a little bit closer. So maybe Luca wanted to, was able to get his teammates involved more rather than have to kind of just do it all himself to, to catch up like he did in the, in the second half of game one. So I just yeah. think it's a little bit of a different type of um, tempo and, and environment. Agreed. And I think one of the surprising things about this bet and like, not to like recap some of like the bad, like some of the losses, but like at the same time, yeah, we, when we bet, this under because we talked about it you bet it in like we bet it in slightly different ways right but we both were ultimately uh-huh. on under eight and a half he had one assist on seven potentials in game one and i was like you know even if he yeah. doubles the seven like this could which is what he did he had 11 assists on 14 potentials that's a wow. relatively high conversion rate um it is it's not like a super see high amount of yeah, you see yeah. yeah yeah tatum, tatum, tatum was like crazy that. Tatum was 12 assists on 13 potentials. So it's really like fascinating because you, you see those kind of numbers and you're like, wow, like they really kind of converted on some of these that, um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe weren't, you know, great opportunities or, you know, like they, they, they kind of exceed, they exceeded the expectation or so to speak. So definitely, uh-huh. definitely an interesting, definitely an interesting spot. Um, and obviously potentials are a little bit wonky. Like there was one yeah. assist that I think was the assist that sent Luca to eight. Um, and he passed to PJ Washington on the wing and PJ Washington made like multiple moves, uh, like, like got into a post move and like Euro stepped and they still gave Luca the assist. And I was dying. Um, I was yeah, like, you're not yeah, kidding yeah. me, man. Like, like you really gave him that one. They were, there was a couple of those that like, were like, Hmm, I don't know if like, I don't, I don't know if the, the statistician is like trying to get him to get a triple double or not, or I don't know what's going on, you know? <laughs> I do think it's notable though that Derek White, because Derek White had five assists on two potentials in Game One. Game Two, two assists on three potentials. So yeah, I think that there's that. probably a little yeah. bit of regression due for Derek White there, um, and maybe there's a little bit of an opportunity to maybe like back off of him in one way, shape, or form. Like I think Derek White's excellent. Obviously, um, he had a really good assist series. Uh, against Indiana he's been really good on this three and a half assists throughout the course of the season but there's a three and a half that's juiced realistically the line that you're really looking at is a four and a half in the market Um, that's at Mm. plus money and the under is at minus 150 or so at DraftKings so maybe that what side are you leaning you're leaning the over or the under I would lean the under honestly um, just based on kind of what we've seen and the fact that Derek White's really been used as a shooter like he's been like their best three point shooter throughout the series. So yeah, he's, at, yeah. he's also at eight and a half RA, um, which I think is an interesting look. Um, he's one for six. You know, I can, that you know, it would be interesting Dallas. though. Um, we, yeah. you know, we always talk about correlated parlays, right? What yeah. if to deduce the odds here, I tried doing it with Luca 25 plus points under eight and a half assists didn't work, but 
what if we did, we just said, you just said what, you, what uh, Derek White is. He's a spot up shooter. He, they're using him as a, as a shooter. So yeah. what if you did under four and a half assists and two plus three pointers made? That could be, that could be kind of nice. Let's see. Let's see. Let's try to build that out real quick. I'm going to yeah, look yeah. at on DraftKings right now. So bear with me as we build this here. Um, but a lot of the but, reason why that is though, just, just, just to like talk about the assists, um, mm-hmm. it's kind of coming from both Jason Tatum and, and Jalen Brown. And that's from the drives here. Check yeah. out these stats, you know, in, in the, um, regular season, Jason Tatum passed out on drives 2.3 per two point. He averaged 2.3 passes on drives in regular season. Jalen Brown yeah, averaged 3.4, but the last two games, the 2.3 turned into 13 passes on drives. And then the 3.4 from Jalen Brown turned into 10.5 passes. So almost like quadruple passing on drives, which uh, is like changing the way passes are being funneled uh, more so from Jalen Brown, and Jason Tatum than in the previous series from like Derek white to, to like Jason Tatum. Like, do you follow yeah, what I'm I, saying? Or Yeah, I, I think that that's like a decent way to kind of look at it too because instead of having Brown and Tatum as more – I don't want to call them like ancillary characters, right, in this. Um, but at the yeah. same time, they're being used as more like primary facilitators of the offense um, and having so their too. hands like involved throughout like the entire – basically throughout the entire game. So it's definitely, I think, a look. I think it definitely makes a little bit of sense. You can get this at uh, – Derek White under four and a half assists. Derek White two plus threes at minus one ten at BetMGM. So that's solid. You know, something that's pretty I don't mind solid. That at all. I don't mind that at all. The two threes are almost like automatic for Derek White. Yes, so far yes. throughout the postseason too. Because if we look at his, if we look at his postseason I mean, numbers, eight, or, eight and ten attempts the last the first two games. He just needs to make two of those. Yeah, he's you made. Know? He's made. Uh, He's made two or more in 14 of 16 games throughout the playoffs, and the numbers have just been there. I mean, he's made three and four against Dallas. Uh, he's getting plenty of those looks, so I, I think I think I'm going to add this to I'm going to add this as a play. Like I really like this. It's a nice little correlated parlay here. I think it's very um, correlated. You know, yeah, and it, and it dejuices it. Minus one ten is very playable, right, Joe? Yeah, I think that that's a great line because I shot I was shopping it around a little bit while you were talking while we're kind of kicking it back and forth. FanDuel is only giving you minus they're giving you minus one twenty two, and DraftKings that's actually right. won't even let you parlay it. So that tells you everything that you need, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, I, I do think this is a pretty good I do think this is a pretty good look for for game three. Um, what what other plays are you on for game three? I know I have one that is like quick here. Um, and it's Chris Stapps Porzingis over the for three and a half first quarter points. Again, love like, that. Yeah. I, you love that. Dude. It, like, yeah. I, I just don't like understand, like I get that he's on, you know, like some sort of minutes limit. He's coming off the bench, like whatever the dude has just been incredible. Like he's, he's just not, he's not missing this line and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't need a ton of minutes. I know that maybe, you know, maybe he's hurt. Maybe he doesn't play um, his normal rotation right now. But at the same time, like, he's crushing. He's just crushing this line. He is still mm-hmm. averaging uh, in these games where he's played. Because I think it's fair to say, like, let's cap him at seven minutes, right? Um, just because, like, you know, I'm a little nervous about, like, the minute ceiling. He's coming off the bench. He still hit this in six of eight games this season when he's playing seven minutes or more. Um, 81% of the games this season overall, and he's had eight plus in five of eight games. So, like, you're getting three and a half points at plus 105. I think it might have moved to minus money now uh, since I tweeted it earlier today. Um, but you can get seven plus at plus 425 at bet 365 and 10 plus at 13 to one. Like, he's hit, the, he's had eight or more in five of eight games this season where he's played at least seven minutes so like i just i think the matchup's been great for him um and you know he was like in these two in the two games he's played six and a half seven minutes he's taken five and three field goal attempts but at the end of the day he's he's also taken two free throws in the game that he took five field goal attempts and he took four field goal uh free throws in the game he took three field goal attempts so he's getting to the line as well um so those always like kind of pull away from those field goal attempt numbers so i, I think that there's plenty of opportunity here for porzingis in, in game three again is there anything that you can think of that's like a reason to not play this basically or uh do, are you pretty comfortable with this as well 
I think it's, um, to be honest with you, it, I think it's a very fair line, three and a half. I'm assuming it's like juiced, right? What is it? Minus 140? No, it's plus money. Oh, it's plus money. okay. Yeah, that yeah. that changes things. Um, but yeah. I was looking <laughs> I was looking at the first quarter rotations, right? Um, they they played Maxi Kleber for like uh, half the first quarter last game. And, yeah. you know, the... I don't. I don't know if that's going to continue. Like we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, when Kleber is in the game, it really takes out like the paint defense. And um, you know, with, with Chris Stapps, it's it's a matter of mismatches with him. Like they're going to really, if if he if they see he's on like a Josh Green or like a sh- a shorter guy, they're going to like feed him the ball and like make him shoot over. Um, yeah. I think it's just like maybe I, I don't know. I think he he probably gets like three to four shots out right. So he, yeah, maybe he, just he, he should probably get four. I would imagine he gets like four shots, um, which is just like he's he's a good shooter. Like you don't need – you just don't need a lot with three and a half. You, you just know, need two, you two, need two baskets. You need two layups. Yeah, it's, it's, two, it's two buckets. It's, it's a dunk. It's a three and a free throw. Like there's mm. so many ways to get to the four that it just seems like – Yeah, I don't I think – yeah, I don't think you need to overthink it to be honest with you. I, 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 I dig it. Yeah, because I mean I think really what it is is – and I think it's because, like, there's that interplay between the full game lines and, like, the first quarter lines, right? Um, and I think you see this a lot of times where it's like, well, this player does a lot of their scoring in the first half or they, this player does a lot of their scoring in the second half. And um, Porzingis is one of those guys. Uh, Kyrie Irving had been one of those guys as well where he wasn't really scoring necessarily to start some of these games uh, mm-hmm. depending on the series that he was in. And he was coming out a little bit more in the second half. Um and they almost can't like adjust the lines properly because they're saying like, well, his point prop for the game is say like, like Porzingis is 13 and a half. So it's like, how much more can you like stack it on the front end? Even if you know, that's what the rotation is. Yeah. I'm looking at it right now. So actually you moved and you, the market's moving to it to be actually over. Now it's minus 112 where you got of that plus odds. So when you see like closing line value like that, you don't want to think like, oh, the bet's now a winner, but it's 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 a good feeling, right? Yeah, I, I think it's always a good sign. And I mean, it it is like sometimes it is a little like, um, mm-hmm. I don't, I want to, I, I think it's like a little flawed. Like, you know, you experience it probably a little bit more than me with, you know, you've got like a hundred and whatever thousand followers on Twitter. <laughs> um, I've got 30 now. We hit that threshold. But, uh, but still at the same time, it's like you put out a play and people are jumping on it like it's it's a lot of it's automated so um Mm -hmm. you know you'll see where one book moves to a number like they were the best number and then all of a sudden now they're the worst number like five minutes later um but you can still get maybe a better number before so definitely is interesting i think it's definitely like a nice like interplay and something to kind of keep an eye on um but what else are you looking for in this game because i know that there's been a couple other players that have really like continued to dominate for for you and players that you've been backing not only throughout the course of this series but throughout the course of the playoffs as well yeah so that's a good transition so what i like off the gate going into game three and i played this last game at 11 and a half points it's bumped up two points since it's pj washington on the mavericks over 13 and a half points right now i'm seeing it at minus 125 on DraftKings. i'm assuming by the time, you know, it's Wednesday, that that line will probably be 14 and a half. But um, I was telling you off the show, even though it rose two points, I still don't think we're paying the premium yet here for P.J. Washington. He's coming off two games uh, going over this line, 14 points and 17 points. And the great news about it, too, is I don't think that he's had ceiling games yet. Like no. this last game, he scored 17 points on one of five three point shooting. The game before that, 0 of 3. He's yet to have a 2-plus 3-pointer game. And it's not like the shots have been poor quality. Like, he's kind of been their go-to above-the-break 3-point shooting guy, which the Celtics seem to be wanting to, like, leave open and taking away those corners. So that's that's good for him. But the most important thing why I like it is because he has this, like, mismatch on Derek White that he, the, the Mavericks like to push that button every once in a while. And it's it's a size mismatch, honestly. So like Luca or Kyrie will kind of give him the ball, and you'll see him a lot of the times where he'll kind of just take take Derek White to the rim, and you know he has that to add to his floor, um, just the overall aggressiveness that we're not really used used to him seeing 
um, in the regular season where we're more so used to him seeing, frankly, just being a spot up guy. So when you when you add more dribbles and, you know, he's more of a, a third option now, like he, he can add more to his repertoire. I like that. Uh, I like the upside for him. And I still think I still think the 13 and a half number is, is low. So I'm going to probably be uh, firing on that as my first prop for game one. Yeah, I like it. And I think it's interesting because there's always a conversation with a lot of players like PJ, right? Where it's like, do I yeah, take the yeah. threes or do I do, do I take the threes or do I take the points? Um, yeah. Because it's hard to like envision him going over, but at the same time, he's actually been going over this line without the threes. Um, that's so that's the big thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you almost have to think of the threes as like a bonus here, uh, in my opinion. And, yeah. you know, the, the fact that he's willing to put the ball like on the floor um, and get to the rack has been really, really important and success and like a big reason why he's been able to have like some continued success in this series. Um, so I, I like that play. Um, also, too, you, you got to do some math here with that. Like PJ Washington, he is the safest guy that's not Luca or Kyrie to play more than 30, 32 plus minutes on the court. You do, you do yeah. some math here. Essentially, he just has to get three point, he has to average 3.5 points per quarter, right? Simple yeah. enough, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think it's a great, I think it's a great play. I was on it, I, I kind of got in on it a little bit later. Yeah, you've seen a couple, of, couple of footages to see like what the role is, I get it, yeah. Yeah, so, but either way, like I do like it. I think that we're, I think that we're in a pretty good position. Um, one player that I'm curious to know your thoughts about because mm-hmm. I played him. I played him last game. We got a void. Uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. Yeah, right? his, yeah. his points prop last game was at over two and a half points. And what I thought was interesting about the about the play was I know he didn't see any court time, so we just got a void. It got sent back to us, but the line moved like significantly because it opened at like plus one twenty. Um, for the two and a half and I think by close and it opened only like five minutes ten minutes before the game by the time the game started that was like a minus 130 prop um oh wow do you have any thoughts on Tim Hardaway Jr. or like playing some of these players where you know like maybe you get a void like we don't know what their minutes are um but at the same time like there's somebody like it's it's one it's one basket for a guy like Tim Hardaway Jr. yeah any yeah thoughts on playing guys like that um I think it's honestly, if you have a good feeling that he sees a role, because it can really hurt you if, if, if you go that route. And a, a prime example of that is, is um, what's his name? Har- James Hardy. I said James Hardy. Um, James Hardy. Hardy. Yeah. James- <laughs> I said James Hardy for the Lakers. Um, <laughs> Jaden Hardy. He played two minutes last game. Like it can blow up in your face. Like if, if you want to go yeah. that route. However, um, Tim Hardaway Jr. I like that look. If we, if we do see a line, I doubt it because he didn't see that many minutes last game. I doubt the books are going to want to yeah. put out a line. But um, I just think going into game three, going into game four, they really need those above the break three-pointer looks because obviously the Celtics are like allowing that. Uh, in the regular season, he was, I believe, third in above the break attempts. So he's definitely yeah. like he definitely fits that type of um, profile, right? Um, yep. And the way I see him getting minutes, honestly, and they're going to really need shooting is through – Maxi Kleber, um, Maxi Kleber, I was kind of talking about a little bit earlier, but he just doesn't look himself. Um, you, you know, he's great. He don't get terrible. me wrong. Yeah. You don't get me wrong. He's great defending uh, Jason. Well, he's great when he's defending Jason Tatum, but he's in the game to to shoot the ball when he gets the when he gets the looks, and he's just like turning down the looks. He's turning down yeah. the passes. He he doesn't doesn't look confident. And then when you're you don't look confident, and, and they're giving you opportunities, it's like you can't be on the court in these, in these types of moments. So I wouldn't be surprised going forward that we start seeing his minutes start shrinking. And then like Tim Hardaway Jr. um, I think his minutes can kind of like benefit from that. Yeah. Like I I think that there's always like a little bit of room for adjustments and this is a pretty young, like overall, this is a pretty young Dallas team. Right. And I think that maybe we would have seen some Tim Hardaway had Dante Exum not like come in, you know, he got in when his first stint, he got a rebound in his second stint. I think he hit a three, um, like right away. So maybe like, maybe had that not happened, maybe we would have seen a little bit of Tim Hardaway jr. In this game. Um, but yeah, I do yeah. think that, you know, with these younger teams, they're going home for game like game three of the, of the finals. Um, everybody should feel like a little bit more comfortable. I I do think this is a good spot to to kind of look to back some of these Dallas role players um, as they probably are going to be a little bit more comfortable in game three playing at the house. 
Mm -hmm. One play that I like uh, for this for this for the game anyway is I'm looking at Dallas minus like minus one minus a half like okay. whatever wherever you can yeah, get it, yeah. uh, but not for the game for the first half. So okay. a big thing here is that since 2006, teams down 0-2 in the series are 91-47-1 against the spread in just the first half. And it actually gets better the deeper in the playoffs that you go. Teams coming home for game three off a road loss by more than five are 110-64-6 against the spread in the first half. 19 and six in the conference finals or later. That's a 76% hit rate in the first half. This is Brandon Anderson pulled these stats from the action network. It's something like mm -hmm. we kind of always keep track of it. So I just looked at his article cause he had the numbers up there. Um, but look, it's a bet that I'm absolutely making. Uh, I don't really care whether Porzingis is in or out. It's just, it's a spot play. It's kind of a system play. Um, and, you know, Dallas did hang in there in the first half yeah, of game yeah. two. They, they definitely like, like, like showed signs, yeah. Yeah, it kind of like fell apart in the second half a little bit. Boston got a little bit more comfortable. They started making a couple more threes. Um, and that seemed to be what the issue was. So I'm going to be grabbing them in the first half of game three. Um, and looking at it, looking kind of to back them that way, uh, and, and still kind of not really stepping on all the toes of some of my other plays that, you know, I kind of talked about before, like Boston in four or five or six or something like that. I um, like it, man. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm prop bomb. So I, I just specialize in props. I don't really do the, the other stuff. <laughs> um, I know. Fair enough. Uh, no, no, that's that's a good one. I like the I like the trends that that support that look. And uh, shout yeah. out Brandon Anderson for for giving you that. D dude's goaded, goaded. Um, now <laughs> I know one of the plays, one of the plays, and I I think this is interesting too because when you're watch, when you're betting on these playoff series, a lot of times we talk about you know like making adjustments for the players, the coaches, stuff like that. But I think sometimes we have to make adjustments as betters, right? And okay. in game two. Uh, we both were on two, like we could have both cashed, but we didn't both cash. I was on, okay. I like Tatum RA, uh, at the 14 and yeah. a half and you wanted, yeah, I like yeah. the over and you like the under on Tatum's assists. And mm -hmm. I understood what you were saying though, because a lot of your analysis yeah, yeah. was talking about like how you think that, you know, it like, it didn't work for like, it didn't work trying to do that to Tatum didn't work. Um, what did you see that kind of is changing your tune here? Like, like, did your brain, like, are you having like a, are you having like a different moment here now where after you watched now two games of this, you're saying like, ah, like, I think that there's something on the other side of this that I think I want to try to take advantage of. Right. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, I'll be transparent here going into game two. I really thought the under five and a half assists for Jason Tatum really stood out to me as a sharp kind of look um, as soon as halftime it lost. So it was, I was way off here. He had one assist in the first quarter and then he had like seven in the second quarter. A lot of the reason why that is though, is, um, I sent this to you, you know, off, off, um, off air, but um, the Celtics have essentially what, what they're doing is they're, they're targeting Luka Doncic, Kyrie Irving. They're kind of manipulating four, four positions with their guys. And um, they're kind of, you know, uh, Jason Tatum had 28 drives last game. So he generates a lot of his assists when he's driving and then he's creating um, cleaner looks when he's passing out. And I saw that a lot last game. Um, he, he had a lot of his, he had a lot of his uh, assists from, from three pointers and also from tape from like uh, opening up floor positions. So um, I like the over five and a half assists. It's like minus minus one thirty five. still hasn't moved despite him getting 10 assists last game. I thought maybe it would have been would have been six and a, six uh, and a half, but uh, it do, it is a little concerning though. He was really efficient with those conversions because game one, I think he had like fourteen or fifteen potentials, and then yep. this game he had like I think one or few one one fewer, but had double yeah. um, what he had in game one. Um, yeah, I that's another one there right now because yeah. he's averaging then eight point five on thirteen point five, so it's almost like it balanced out through two games and you're like, yeah, like that's not unreasonable. It's probably like a little bit of a high clip, but at the same time, mm -hmm. Tatum's gravity is by far, I think like the greatest of any. Yeah, and, they, and they were doubling him too. Don't even get me wrong. That's kind of also where that happened as well. It, they just really, 
uh, didn't want him to get hot. That's the thing, right? It's like he's on a cold stretch right now. Like you're seeing the numbers that he's putting up is like historically terrible, like field goal percentage yeah. wise. So, so bad. They're, yeah, they're, I, I just feel like they're just trying to like make it make him uncomfortable as, as you know, as most as they can um, and give him t- and give him hard looks. And when that happens, he has to be more of a playmaker and get other teammates involved. Um, I think that's yeah. what's happening. No, I, I think that you're I think that you're spot on in regards to Tatum uh, and like kind of his gravity. And it's kind of created it's created like a little bit of a nasty discourse about, you know, like just how good he is or anything like that. And yeah, I, nice I, I want to touch on that in a bit. But one of the things about the assist that I wanted to get to right now was last time we were on the pod, I talked about betting Tatum assist leader at plus 750. Tatum is now actually ahead of Luca, and he's pretty like significantly ahead of Luca. He's at seventeen. Luca's at twelve. Luca is still like minus one sixty five or so in the market, down from like yeah. minus seven hundred pre series. I my inclination is to say like I think you need to let it ride one more game um, mm-hmm. and hope that Tatum has like a six or seven assist game. Luca yeah. maybe yeah. paces with him. Um, that's, I think how I would try to play it just because mm-hmm. like, I think it's a little bit hairy. I think you're not getting enough value right now. I think the, the, I think the Tatum assist leader was like a good bet and we're just going to have to try to live with it a little bit, but I don't, I don't, I don't hate if you want to hedge it. I do think it's a two man race between the two of them. I don't sure. think that I, there's really anybody so else well, that's yeah. going to really get involved, uh, especially at the number that Tatum's at. Um, but one other Boston Celtic that's been tremendous throughout the course of the playoffs and throughout the course of this series in particular, he's looked so comfortable, is Drew Holiday. Drew mm. Holiday has been dynamic for Boston, and I yeah. like Drew to go over 10.5 rebounds and assists. Um, I think that this is a number that's I, – I, I think it's just honestly like a little bit too low for him given what he's been able to do so far in the playoffs. He's hit this now in six straight playoff games – and eight of his last nine, uh, he's been cruising uh, as he's gotten a little bit more comfortable, I think. And honestly, the games that I would have expected him to do like worse in were in those games against Miami, were in those games against Cleveland. Based a lot of like a lot of it has to do with like the defensive coverage that they have, the players that they have, and like what the personnel is. So this has been like a really excellent series for him. He's had thirteen and fourteen uh, rebounds and assists in games one and two. Um, and when we look at some of the underlying data, he's been tremendous. He's actually leading both of these teams in rebound chances. He's at 9.5 rebounds per game, and he's okay. leading at uh, 16.5 rebound chances per game. Um, and then for the assists, he's at four assists per game on 9.5 potential assists. So, like, there's a lot of potentials here. The minutes are up. He's playing almost 38 minutes a game. Um, I think the 10.5 is just too low for a guy especially now i think going on the road to dallas i think that him having that championship pedigree like having won the chip with uh the milwaukee bucks is going to pay dividends for him here he's going to really be a leader in game three i think there's some opportunity here on the 10 and a half rebounds and assists let me ask you this though with the rebounds do you what do you, okay i want to ask you what do you think Kyrie? how do you think Kyrie is going to come out in game three because like i think that can maybe hurt the rebounding upside if Kyrie Irving is a little bit more aggressive and he demands more attention from Drew Holiday and he's getting more ball, uh, more possession. So uh, there's Luca talking about Luca. Yeah, chilling. <laughs> um, um, so, so, yeah, so what I was saying was how do you, how, what do you anticipate uh, Kyrie's involvement being in game three? Do you think he bounces back? Do you think he has um, – do you think, he, you know, his aggressiveness is – going to be like shown in game three so I do commercial think, break commercial break no <laughs> i do think that i do think that Kyrie like should try to be a little bit more aggressive honestly um and you know we'll we'll have to see like just exactly how it kind of shakes out but at the same time like peyton pritchard was putting him in jail like that like, sure. like there was a possession like you know it's like this guy he's been incredible um handle wise sam hauser hauser too like these guys yeah he was given pj washington trouble he was pj washington was trying to drive and, and hauser and he wouldn't let him budge yeah no so it definitely is like an interesting scenario 
Kyrie's just hasn't really looked that good. And I don't know what the deal is. Maybe going home helps a little bit, but we'll we'll just kind of have to see. We'll have to see kind of how it shakes out a little bit, uh, a little bit here. He's laughing at Kyrie. Um, <laughs> um, but I did also sprinkle, and I think it's worth a sprinkle. I'm um, sorry, we're not going to discuss the uh, hostile crowd for Kyrie. I, I, we 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 can actually. It's got to um, be a part of it, no? Yeah, I mean, head. mentally, although he's not admitting it, definitely getting into. He'll his never head. admit it. He's not that no. kind of guy. Do you, do you think there's a betting angle on Kyrie, PB? Um, I, the assists could be a solid look. I believe he had four, or I believe he had fourteen potential assists last game, and. Um, again, it just comes down to Dallas role players stepping up at home. Maybe like that gives – that's like the change, changing factor of maybe they start hitting their shots. A lot of the – if they're like – I mean, I'm looking at the stats in front of me. They're shooting 15% from above the break threes of the series of role players. Like this is talking about P.J. Washington, Derek Jones. Assuming we can get that number maybe to like 30% instead of like, you know, 15, that could, I think, positively um, help – Kyrie Irving's assist, that's kind of where I'm looking at in the market for yeah. him. And, and you usually should expect like an uptick from your role players at home. Um, you should expect them to be able to convert on some of those looks. Like you're not in front of a hostile crowd. Um, and you're just usually a little bit more comfortable. You're going through your routines, like everything. Like I think that maybe that's like a good opportunity for for them. You yeah, know, in six this assists on 14 out. potential. Six, six assists yeah. on 14 potential and the line's four and a half. A little bit more room to grow, especially when you consider that like Luca, what converted eleven out of fourteen. Um, so we'll, we'll just kind of have to see how that shakes out. But I do like, I do kind of like that look there. Um, w- one other thing with Drew Holiday uh, before I want to get into this other uh, this other conversation with you, uh, I, I did play a little bit of Drew Holiday to be the series rebound leader at forty to one on DraftKings. Mm-hmm. Look. I think it's worth a little bit of a sprinkle. He is one rebound behind Tatum, two rebounds behind Luka. Uh, I just like a lot of times like grabbing these like high variance type of guys um, in some of these spots, just based on the fact that like, you know, we, we know that he just had this great game. The rebounding chances are there. I know that like there's some like, data that's a little bit wonky here like one of the things that you pointed out um was like drew holiday's average rebound distance is far it's 9.7 feet which is significant it's almost double as far as like tatum and lucas which you know isn't necessarily conducive to you know being able to consistently get rebounds throughout the course of the series but at the same time al horford chris has porzingis not necessarily like the best rebounding options there. Like they can, but they're just not like the biggest ones. So we do have to see, you know, kind of how this, how this goes. But I I think it's worth a sprinkle here at the 40 to one, um, just given the fact that it's entirely possible we see a sweep. And what, if we do see a sweep, it always introduces more variance. It helps some of these underdogs, these long shots actually cash because they yeah, don't yeah. have to consistently keep this up for the entire mm-hmm. series. They just have yeah, to say, yeah. like, all right, like, if Luka and Tatum have a bad game, they might not even have to have a bad game if Drew just continues to keep having, like, these in- exceptional games rebounding the basketball. Um, so I think it's worth a sprinkle there. Um, but I did want to talk to you about what's going on right now because the biggest conversation, I think, at this point surrounding this finals is, like, what like who who is the MVP? Like who are you voting for? Like who do you think is the best player uh, in this series? Who do you think is the most deserving? Because I think like no matter depending on who you ask, you can get a different answer from like anybody uh, on this series. Yeah, yeah. So right now, um, even despite him having terrible shooting, I still would give it to Jason Tatum personally. Uh, we could talk about like who else I would give it to, but I just think Jason Tatum, despite him not scoring, he's he's contributing in other ways, right? So he's playing point guard a lot on offense. He's defending this Derek Lively on defense. He's um, attacking to the rim and setting up a high quality assists. So the the scoring I think will bound to like he's going to have a game where he gets twenty five points. This is probably the lowest the best price you can honestly get it before he gets that 25 or 30 point game. And that's like the heavy favorite. So I think it's a good time to buy on it. And then we could talk about, you know, the next person I think has a good shot. It's true holiday. 
we just spoke about him. Drew, I don't know what the odds are right now, but I think the voters, are, when they look at Drew Holiday, not just going to look at the fact that he had that 21-point game, but if he continues to shut down Kyrie Irving, I think that defense, that whole defensive like factor is going to maybe play a role in helping him get that MVP. Um, I kind of said it coming into the show, you know, the Celtics are playing like a team right now. It's every single person stepping up at, in different games. But what's been consistent is Drew Holiday shutting down Kyrie Irving, you know? Like imagine, yeah. imagine it's game four and – Kyrie Irving has back-to-back duds. He still has duds. They're gonna they're gonna credit Drew Holiday for that. Yeah, I, so I think that that's thinking. definitely. I think that's definitely like an angle because Drew, depending on the book, is like around like seven and a half to one or so to speak. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I do agree with you though. I think that Tatum is still the MVP. And yeah, yeah. He is, he's to me is the player that still has the ability to have like a ceiling game. And then everybody's Definitely like, whoa, yeah. Yeah. that was a big game. Like that was a monster game. You know what I mean? And look, his gravity is incredible. And that's part of why he's been so good as a passer. Um, mm-hmm. I know that the shooting's been the shooting's been bad. And I saw I saw a tweet and I like was losing my mind because it was like if you trade, if you swapped Josh Hart and Jason Tatum, the series result would be the exact same right now. And I was losing it because I was Whoa. like, it's kind of it's funny because like the numbers, it looks like a Josh Hart <laughs> stat line. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, this is a good time. I just think this is a good time to like buy on like really the media is, is thinking that he, this guy is terrible, but you know, yeah, just wait for one big and, game and then, yeah. And the thing is, like, these guys that vote, it's fascinating because I was listening to the Hoop Collective um, after the Eastern Conference Finals, and Bon Temps was talking about, because there's, like, nine people that vote. It's only, like, nine voters. And yeah, they, yeah. like, to me, like, looking at that series, I was like, oh, like, Jalen Brown was, like, the best player in that series. Like, he deserved to win Eastern Conference mm-hmm. Finals MVP. The odds during the game went to at some point Tatum was like going oh, that, the game, yeah. and, was the going and then during this. the game Tatum moved like minus like a thousand, and Bontemps it was funny because Bontemps was talking about it and he said they literally like within the fourth quarter they knew Boston was going to win they still didn't know who the Finals MVP was and then it went to Brown because Brown made like the assist on a on the Derek White dagger three at the end of the game, and they were like, well, that won the game, that won the series. Do you think it's more of like a recency bias thing, like a recency yeah, bias? Like, like, oh, like, it's insane. Like, that's crazy. It, it's like they didn't watch the whole season. I'm like, I don't understand, like, how – like, like thank God Jalen Brown won. He deserved it. But at the same time, it's like that's – I feel like they should have, like, a fan vote on this. Yeah. They should have that, and they should also incorporate like a fan vote. You know what I mean? Like a majority vote be one of those. There should be like What's something. I don't. Yeah. I almost think that they should vote like after every game or something. Like almost like it's like vote after every game. Like do like something. I don't like. Um, <laughs> yeah, like like or something. But like it was fascinating because the vote was five four for Brown, and Tatum still got four votes, and Tatum like wasn't good during that series so yeah, I, yeah. I, I think it's fascinating because then it's like kind of says to me if tatum does have like a monster game like a legacy game in game three or four and they win in like a sweep or something like that does that really make that probably swings it rather easily to tatum because you're gonna look at all the stats and you're like well he's leading in rebounds he's leading in assists he's probably like yeah. at least close to leading in points despite the percentages the numbers are probably going to pop off the page. Yeah, look, and, and with Tatum too, like it's it's good for him. I think it works. It works to his favor is that he's starting off poor because the narrative could be he started off poor, but he finished off he finished off strong, rather than he started off strong but then finished off poor. You know, like he still has more exactly. room to improve on. And honestly, um, like it, I, yeah. I know the shooting has been bad, but the rest yeah. of the numbers have been great. You know, exactly. as rebounds have been great. This, been, yeah. So, it's so um, many, so many, he's created so many points um, that this, you know, the stats just don't really show too much. And um, it could also be another thing too, like with going with Tatum, maybe it's like a voter's regret type thing. Like, oh, we don't want like his legacy to like looked at, look back at it as like, oh, we didn't vote for him as MVP and he lost that or something. And even though he had, I don't know, you know, what I'm trying to go with this, like, I type little, like, yeah, like, uh, it's like the current like Curry. I feel like had like a little bit of a stain 
um, with him just based on like, you know, winning, like Iguodala gets it, then Durant yeah, yeah. comes and like whatever. So it, I, I think that there was, you know, I, I can, I can kind of get that narrative or get that angle as well. Um, yeah, yeah. So before, before we get to pods and Rex, uh, who do you like, how long do you think the series goes? What's your, what's your prediction right now? I, I know we're a little limited with Boston up 2-0, but what do you think happens here? Uh, and I, I think we kind of know who you think would be finals MVP. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Celtics in five. I think Mavs get I'm gonna say Mavs get game three. I hope so. Um, I think they they showed that they showed some adjustments that you know went into game two. Celtics shot 25 percent and lost. Kyrie just has to step up. So maybe they get one of the games, but then ultimately um, the Celtics just have too many answers. There's so much talent. The the talent gap is just too extreme. Dallas has never faced that cut type of team before. And honestly, like this team is built is this team is so perfectly built that um, I think it goes to five games. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm with you. I think Celtics in five. I think Dallas is probably going to still be able to pull off one game. Um, maybe we see like a Luka legacy game where he drops like a 60 point triple double. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I think that there's like a possibility for that. It's but it's a big ass, but it's crazy that we think that that's something that Luca could do. Um, so before we get to pods and Rex, though, I want to recap the plays. It was a request we got from one of our followers, one of the listeners, just asked, you know, if we could say what some of our plays were. So okay. uh, prop bomb, prop bomb is on uh, PJ Washington over thirteen oh. and a half points, Tatum over five and a half assists, right? Um, yeah, that those are, and I also, I co-sign with you on the Derek White, if you're about when, yes. the one you get out. Yeah. I co-sign on that. Yeah. So we co-sign, we'll probably tweet this out too. uh, Derek White, two threes and under four and a half assists. And then I'm on, uh, Drew Holiday over 10 and a half rebounds and assists and Chris Stapps Porzingis over three and a half first quarter points. I also, I'm going to sprinkle that little bit of, uh, Drew Holiday rebounds leader at 40 to one at DraftKings. Um, so producer Corey, how you doing, dude? I've never felt this good coming out of spring in my life. Why? Uh, did you take new medicine? This is my recommendation, Joe. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know how it goes. We've been doing this a while. <laughs> Every spring I sit here and bitch and moan about not being able to breathe, ear infections, sore throats, when to take your Allegra to properly get to sleep at night. No more. <laughs> I fixed it. You switched the Zizol, dude? Eight months ago, I started getting allergy shots, and I was very skeptical. (laughs) Very. I have made it out of spring. I had had no problems. I'm pretty sure I had hay fever like three times last year. Yeah. No problem. Incredible. If you're suffering from seasonal allergies, go see an allergist and get some shots. Um, Also, by the way of news, Florida has tied the game at 1-1. That's what you were doing, yeah. Did did you hear me? I was like, goal? (laughs) You're going like, goal. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I just I'm on Florida side because, you know, they're real ones and took care of the biggest problem, the biggest menaces in the NHL, the fucking New York Rangers, those pieces of shit. Troop is a piece of shit. Rempy's a dog shit player and he's also a piece of shit. And he's gonna have a short career. And I'm so happy that they are dead and buried for the rest of this year. I recommend that you go outside and enjoy the sun knowing that the Rangers <laughs> will never win a Stanley Cup while I'm alive. What a, what a recommendation. <laughs> what a recommendation. Uh, oh, wear some sunscreen, too. Don't get burnt. Fair enough. Sun, yeah. Enjoying yeah. it. Fair enough. Prop bomb. Yeah. What do you, what do you got? That was going to be now. <laughs> what do you got? No, well, <laughs> no yeah, wear some, scr- wear some sunscreen for sure. And uh, <laughs> I got bitten in the ass for this one. I wanted to do this last-minute trip, a solo trip, go to uh, the Olympics. And I look at my passport. And I oh, see no. the expira- and I see the expiration date is December of this year. So I thought that I'd be I, I thought I'd be okay. But just make sure though, when you're traveling internationally, that your expiration date for your passport is more than six months. Because like there's this there's this thought that like oh you can go you can go there, but then you're like in jail for six months. Like maybe that's why they do it. But <laughs> um, just just make sure that your passport is not expired. Uh, before six months and, and get that checked out as soon as you can. <laughs> Dude, how about this? If you're listening to this right now, grab your passport and just take a look. I know yeah. my you should know. I have to get mine done. Just take I have, take a look. I have to get a new one. 
Oh no! I gotta, you do? I gotta redo it. No, mine's just expired. I just haven't gotten it renewed oh. in like years. No trafficking violations. Yeah, I just haven't been out of the country, so you know it just hasn't been an issue. Um, <laughs> so that's a solid. That's a great recommendation, honestly. Um, mine. Yeah. What? Mine is going to be what's well, producer Corey's date here. I see him looking. Mine's December, so I'm... next May. Oh, you got to get All right, you're, done. You're good. You're good. Dude, Dave, but I wouldn't have looked. Dave's wedding, man. I might be in Italy next summer. I'm going to need to fix that. Yeah, we're going to all be there. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be something. Um, oh, boy. I am going to recommend oh, – man. Oh, I That's got nice. – I finally got one of the – I finally caved. I got one of those bathing suits that has, like, the liner on the inside, <laughs> like the not the not mesh one, like the – you know the one I'm talking about. The like, net? Like the net inside no, the bathing like, suit? Like or? a boxer brief, like, liner. And <laughs> – it's unbelievable. It's the most comfortable bathing suit I've ever owned. Have you gone to the beach yet? Uh, I've been to the river a bunch of times, not the beach yet this year. Why don't you report back after you go to the beach? Oh, is it bad for the beach? <laughs> That's going to be the true test. Oh, this is – see, this is – That's where the sand gets in there and turns your fucking crotch into a cheese grater. Oh, Damn. so – okay, yeah. so maybe this makes some sense then because – I like most of the time now, like I, instead of going to the beach because I moved, it's like I'm going to the river and we don't really I'm not getting that type of sand like in in like the like the, the groinal area, you know, you're safe there. Yeah, so I'm safe. Yeah. So like these are just absolutely elite for being out there okay. because it's like you're wearing like you're wearing like waterproof or like wicking underwear like with your thing. And, like You don't have the net. Because nobody likes the net. The net is like one of the what worst the f- things. Who ever. came up with the net? The net's crazy. I spent my teenage years cutting them out of every fucking pair of, of like, swim yeah. shorts I ever had. I know. Who came up with that shit? It's insane. Like, but now I'm Hang like, that one on the boomers, too. Fucking idiots. Dude. Uh, Putting nets in bathing suits, you morons. Now I'm like, do I no. need the net? Like, do I cut the net out? Like, it's it's a disaster. Uh, next time you go to the beach, I'm going to need you to report back your findings. Because if it can, you know, if you can avoid sand getting trapped in there, you might be fine. But... Yeah, that's a... I'm that's a big very curious mark, about honestly. your crotch right now. It's a big question mark, honestly. But maybe um, you should go through the extremes to see like if, if it actually is the case, you know? Yeah, I think I'm gonna <laughs> I smell a new series <laughs> coming. I'm gonna like stop, drop, and roll <laughs> on the beach so that way uh I can let oh, you guys wow. know how my balls are after after wearing this bathing suit on the beach. Um but look, you know, at the end of the day, regardless of what bathing suit you wear, one of the most important things is like even though our balls drop we will not drop the ball for you. And one of the best ways that you can we that you guys know that we won't drop the ball for you is by knowing that we are backing this with a lot of our research through props.cash. And you guys can do it too. So that way you guys don't drop your balls. And you can get this for 25% off your first month with code Delara25. Get all the different data, get the advanced metrics, get the projections, get it for every single sport. Baseball, basketball, hockey, football, 25% off your first month with code Dolera25. And guys, look, and gals, I know that this is a sports podcast, a basketball podcast. We're almost at the end of the basketball season. We're not mm-hmm. gonna let we're gonna not drop the ball here for you, and we're gonna continue to cash that. Let's do 